our topic today is really uh, emerging technologies and enabling the fourth industrial revolution. We have three perfectly chosen uh, panelists today that really occupy different spaces. So I'm going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to just quickly uh, uh, introduce themselves, uh, their role, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll jump right in. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ravesh Lala, and uh, I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Transformation at IBM Watson. Uh, my focus is, uh, you know, Watson is, is, is a brand new business unit in IBM that we launched about two and a half years ago. And my focus is to really work with clients of IBM to really help adopt these kinds of disruptive technologies in their business. How do you really adopt cognitive computing where you've got a partnership between man and machine and, and how does that really transform the business irrespective of any industry? And what does that transform business look like? I mean, how, how is, what is the future of business going to look like where you have machines either augmenting intelligence or in some cases substituting intelligence you know, for, for, for human beings? So that's what I do is uh, we really help clients from a strategy planning and change management perspective adopt these kinds of technologies. Come here. Come here. Uh, Mihir Shukla, CEO of Automation Anywhere. Uh, we are focused on combining the three pillars of technology as we see it. Uh, you have cognitive, which is to think like a human. RPA, which is to behave like a human. And then which is the other two dimensions Cliff covered in his chart. And the third orthogonal dimension to that is analytics, which is Anything you ever wanted to know about any process exists in real time and you can predict things, right? So we are focused on combining these three aspects and creating a virtual, a, a, a virtual workforce or a digital labor as KPMG calls it, right? Um, and that's what the focus is. We, uh, we are, just to give you a sense of how fast this revolution is happening, we are at 400,000 bots uh, today. And by 2020, we will reach a mark of 3 million bots in production. Uh, at that point, in a manner of speaking, we are the world's largest employer. Uh, and this comes back to Ray's comment about to think exponential. Uh, this is how fast this industry is moving. Uh, just like the Uber is largest taxi company that doesn't own taxes, Airbnb doesn't own rooms, uh, you could have three million digital workforce and be the largest employer. Will you be able to claim those three million people, you know, now in the new labor, you know, unemployment figures? It would be interesting. <laughs> I, I, I have been asked to have to pay the payroll taxes. Well. Yeah, so yeah, there's the virtual and the regular yeah. ones. I yeah. like it a lot. Um, well, I'm Jonathan Crane. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for IPsoft. And like these other two gentlemen, our primary focus is in the digital labor environment. Um, primarily, our early starts were in creating what we'll call virtual engineers. Uh, today on our staff, there's some 20,000 of those virtual engineers working for us in the managed services we provide, but also more importantly, for our clients who utilize this technology to really manage their IT infrastructure and environment. Recently, we announced the invention of Amelia. We've been working on this for quite a long time. Amelia is basically, as she begins her journey today, she's really a virtual customer agent, a virtual employee. So we've got engineers and now employees. So as we see this race for how many virtual employees can you have, it really will be dependent on the adoption rate of the corporations that sit in this room or represented by you in this room. We're gonna see a change in the way we handle our customers. And this is a very important aspect because what we've always seen, and perfect example are the telcos, people who focus on these new technologies for operational efficiencies. While we saw the telco always looking at using technology for operational efficiency, and they let markets drift away from them because they never thought about the usefulness of new technologies that came on to the to the scene like the Amazon clouds and et cetera. So using this technology is gonna be very, very important. And for us in this new virtual customer agent, virtual employee, it's really dreaming about how could you best use this ready now technology to change the way you touch your customers, not focusing solely on operational efficiency, but rather focusing on customer experience. I think that's what we're gonna talk about uh, 
today as we start to take Ray's vision and all of what we've accomplished in this group here and really put it into the marketplace to change the way we relate to our end user. Thank you very much. Um, so just to help set the stage for our panelists, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many of you are in the evaluation stage for automation? How many of you have at least completed a proof of concept? And how many of you are in production in your environment? Okay. So it looks like about 50, 25, 25 in terms of our makeup. And our panel today is really to talk about enabling the fourth industrial revolution. Um, and, and each of you uh, operates in kind of a, a different space today uh, as it pertains to automation, uh, all the way from full cognitive uh, to uh, an orientation toward uh, batched task automation, uh, and then natural language and um, some machine learning specifically as it pertains to uh, managing IT uh, infrastructure. So I'm, I'm interested in uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, this has emerged popularly in, in a big way on the main stage in the last three to four years. But all of you began R&D and working on this stuff in the early, mid-2000s. So what, what changed? What, what happened that, uh, that really has caused this to become front and center? Uh, maybe we can start uh, with uh, Jonathan. Well, I, I think that what you see are some realities of costs that always drive any operational behavior. And the costs are associated with human capital as we continue to try to solve virtualization of hardware and software, those have been accomplished. We've seen a tremendous movement of those kinds of costs into cloud architectures and again, virtualized uh, equipment. So the physicals become virtual, move to a cloud. We've done a great job of managing from an IT perspective that cost structure. But what hasn't been attacked is the cost of human capital. In fact, it continues to rise. And even though you went and did uh, digital uh, labor arbitrage by moving to some of the fine Indian firms or you're in Europe and you're dealing with Eastern Europe or wherever you went, you found the opportunity to lower the labor costs but not appreciably because what we really see is it's the predominant cost of operating your business. So what I think has to happen is we've got to look at that and decide what are the functions that our knowledge workers do today that would lend themselves uh, we'll call them tactical functions that would lend themselves to automation and begin to think about how do we elevate our people, eliminate those routine, repetitive tasks, and do them more reliably, more efficiently, and therefore redeploy our human capital in areas that change the way we operate our business, most noticeably touching your customer. If I'm primarily an inbound customer service center, and that's where I'm spending all of my money, then I'm missing the marketing element and the touch factor proactively to my end user, but I can't get that budget through my CEO. He's holding that back because I can't prove that I can change the revenue structure. So my point is change the cost structure associated with inbound, take some of that investment dollars freed up and put it into the revenue stimulative. And so I think the, that's the, the recent arrival then, and in, in the point uh, here is that that cost structure is now being realized, yes. making, making this possible. Yes. Mihir, how, how, do you, how do you see that? I think what I would add to it, uh, excellent point, what I would add to it is that, truth be told, this, this kind of waves aren't, don't happen by a few visionaries snapping their fingers, right? Uh, what happens is see, a one breakthrough leads to another breakthrough to another one. And then after seven to 10 years, all of them come together and uh, we make a huge leap forward. That's how, it's just the nature of these things, right? So uh, if you look at any smartphone, right, the miniature cameras, miniature batteries, billions of dollars of wireless infrastructure, and million other things had to have happened before iPhone, iPhone could be born. Uh, so bringing down to our world, if you look at the advancement in OCR technologies over many, many years, uh, so many attempts at cognitive AI expert systems for many, many years. Uh, just the establishment of shared services in GBS, which brought all the processes centrally, 
the idea of six sigma and lean, lean methodology that standardized these processes. All of that had to happen for, for, for what we do to be possible. Uh, if we had come 10 years ago, we, it wouldn't work. Uh, and we are there, by the way. <laughs> it, yeah. So it's the timing is right. Yeah. I think Ray made the point that uh, timing is a really important component here. Uh, I, I think you, may, you raise a good point about the adoption of ERP, the standardization of process, the focus on process understanding and reengineering, uh, all kind of converging in time at a point where we also have technological advancement that can be applied to these now segregated, isolated, and standardized processes. Now, in your world, uh, Ravesh, a little bit different. Yes. Uh, IBM Watson is, uh, has, a, has kind of a different history to it. So uh, what, what has brought Watson into the, the spotlight in the last three to four years as a business tool? So for us, we, there's sort of three things that have converged as, as a perfect storm. Number one, the compute power. I mean, you heard Ray Kurzweil talk about the massive amount of compute powers that's required for these kinds of things. Uh, that technology footprint has started to st started to shrink quite a bit, just because of you know Moore's law, the amount of processing power, right? The first version of Watson, in first instance, when we ran Jeopardy in 2011, was massive. Physical. Um, yeah, I, space, I heard that right? every time uh, that uh, uh, Watson was answering a question on Jeopardy, that the, the lights in New York dimmed slightly. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't that bad, but yes, it is now. Uh, the, the 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 physical space in, in Watson is is much smaller. Um, Ten years from now, it's going to get even even smaller than that, right? So the the, the compute power is is shrinking. That's that's point one. Um, point two. You, you heard Ray talk about you know, 300 million modules in the brain. Um, and every time we're trying to reverse engineer the human mind you know, and get Watson to think like, like, like human beings, uh, trying to take those one module at a time and, and try to you know, disseminate that was really hard. You couldn't do that as an on-prem solution. Today, cloud technologies allow you to secure the data and, and really you know, make those algorithms available to everybody, so that's the second thing. But the third most important force, force, which is really on the demand side, is the explosion of information that was happening. Right, that's what really got the adoption to pick up. If you look at every profession, whether it is the business of oncology or diabetes or, or uh, uh, you know wealth management, you know you're going through an explosion of information. And in the professional services space, you know you have more data that you're you're analyzing. So the predominance the same, of yeah. digital information Di yeah. for a corpus. Yes. Right. So and eighty percent of that data, to, you know, was it was invisible to computers. Right. So that's what really helped helped pick up the adoption was the ability to put machines like Watson that can read, you know, eight hundred million page documents a minute, or second, sorry. Right. That that kind of compute power with the explosion of information really made it, you know, helped us get there much faster. That's really interesting. In, in each case, we have a convergence uh, in time, space, capability. We've got cost structures. Uh, we've got specific innovations converging in a recombinant way. Uh, and then we have the ability to deliver massive compute outputs with, based on a giant, ever-expanding digital corpus. Uh, so in each of the three areas, there's really been a unique convergence uh, in time and space. Could, could I uh, add one thing, Lee, yeah, just uh, to the revision and, and your comments? One of the things that we're facing is we're having a, a, uh, uh, a sea change in the way in which we're dealing with business processes, right? We used to take people and put them against those processes and assist them with technology. Now more and more technology is managing and has the ability to manage those business processes, and therefore you require intelligent humans to work with the technology. It's changing the nature of the workforce. And so again, we're finding an obligation to quickly allow for technology to take the routine, the tactical, the undertrained, the less intelligent, the more common skilled people, and move them either out or up or over, and allow for a different workforce level of intelligence to be able to really maximize the kind of value, as Ravesh was talking about, of this proliferation of data. I want very smart people at the hands of understanding, as the uh, technology gives it to them, what to do. 
right? We have more power today to understand how to go forward in our business than we've ever had before. I want people at the helm who really have the intellect to be able to receive that uh, massage data and information and act upon it, mm -hmm. right? That's what I think is really driving. It's the ability to take now data and convert it to actionable intelligence. Yeah. That, that's big and well, huge. If, if we have a chance, we'll talk about yeah. organizational change dynamics yeah. uh, in, in a world, in an enterprise which is, which is adopting uh, automation. So, I'm, I, you know, I was, I was kind of listening to some of the things that Ray was talking about and reflecting on my own journey. Uh, the space is bewildering. I, if I sit back and I try to think, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Ravesh a call and I, I want to put Watson to work in my, in my, in my business, um, that, that seems very daunting. Um, and, and certainly to put Amelia to work uh, in my enterprise, that seems pretty daunting. Like, where do you start? Um, so is, you know, what, what advice would you give everybody here in the room in terms of how to get started uh, and if you've already started, where to go next? And I'm, I, I'm here, I'll start with you um, because I, I, I think you're more aligned with the starting point. Okay. So we, in our experience, when we go meet the customer, uh, the customers would often come to us and say, out of your three toolkits, we need cognitive. And so, okay, we walk in. Uh, and we find that, and it's not unusual, that we find that people who they think were thinking were thinking rules, not thinking thinking. Uh, so what the world isn't as clear about what they need. You know, we sometimes overrate ourselves thinking everything we are thinking is super duper equals MC square, but it's not the case. So when you walk in, you, you go with a, we walk, walk with the toolkit and never know which one would actually be useful to the customer. Uh, and we often find there are exceptions to the rules, but more rule-based, human-based of doing things happens to be your low-hanging fruit. Because anything that we have in a cognitive takes time to learn. There is learning involved. Um, so we often either start with the rule-based or start both in parallel uh, so that the enterprises see the benefits and CFO is happy to sign the next check. Uh, but we, we, we uh, our goal is to get, a, uh, get, get an organization to 500 digital workforce. That's 500 bots in six months. 1,000 in a year and two to 5,000 in two years. And we just set them on, uh, you know, that's the journey, you, that's the cadence you get. And if you are not, you, you get to kind of an assembly line, like, like in old manufacturing days, where you're producing two bots every day and they're going, you know, going in production. So it's, it's equivalent of hiring new, two new employees every day, right? And they, they just keep adding, adding, and that's how you get to 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. Well, I think that there might be some challenges for organizational absorption at that rate. Uh, but what I heard was that it, uh, a best first starting place is really in that task space. Right, I, I, I would distinguish task space because there have been past many task-based automation. This is a human way of doing things, right? Which, I mean, there is an IT way of doing things. But first time we have a human way of thinking and human way of doing. That's n never, never before. So I, I would guess, Ravesh, that you, uh, in, in the, the place you sit on the mountain, might have a different answer to where do people get started. Yeah, I mean, we, there is there is a little bit of an education involved in helping clients understand because I think as human beings, we have our own biases and we want to start to solve the toughest problem first, right? And I use a very simple analogy with my clients. You know, most of us have children. We don't send our kids to med school first and then kindergarten. You really, you know, start with the kindergarten route and train them. So we have to help un clients understand two or three very basic things. One is, um, you know, if you have a human being thinking of a process or a task in a certain way, um, there is no reason for machines to do exactly the same thing, right? I mean, machines are, are more powerful and can actually do things differently and far more efficiently. So really helping un clients understand, pick the right domain, right, where you think, where we think these technologies can add, add value today, not 10 years from now, but today, 
picking the right sweet spots. Because picking the wrong use case is, is, is really terrible. You, you really find out two years later that you picked the wrong use case. So really picking the right domain and framing that journey. How do you maybe start with simple automation first so you can start to get some ROI and, and start to show value, but then really also training the machine with the right kind of content so when the machine is, has learned, has learned from the examples that you know, Ray was talking about, um, then you start to get that hockey stick effect, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got the next use case and the next use case lined up because learn, building the corpus and, and, and making sure you're teaching it with the right content is important. And the one thing that we forget, uh, these, these, uh, these smart technologies don't make answers up, right? Watson does not make up answers. I mean, if you train it on the wrong, you know, on, a, on the wrong answer and you make it think like the, it's the right answer, it'll always think it's, that's the right answer, right? I think in the case of cognitive, people don't necessarily understand that it is going to require the organization's best and brightest mm -hmm. to design a corpus, to guide the, the ingestion of the corpus, and to reinforce the correlations and inferences being uh, discovered by AI. Uh, and use case selection, I think, uh, gets to be really, really important. Jonathan, in, in your space, uh, you know, IP Center uh, is a pretty sophisticated platform for IT management. Um, that, again, feels pretty daunting. Uh, Melia is an NLP engine, pretty sophisticated. So how do you get started? What, what, what's your advice for how people think about getting started? I think it's always, always about isolate a problem that you want to solve. In the case of Amelia, uh, isolate a business process you'd like to change, right? So if we go and take Amelia first for the moment, um, I want to change the way that uh, I sell insurance over the web. It's way too lengthy, too many questions, multiple pages of web instructions and et cetera, and at the end of the day, my click-through rate is maybe a percent. It's a horrible result. Uh, what I want to do is I want to take the information I have available from all of the data that I've constructed in an insurance firm and put it at the hands of an Amelia so I can conversationally, uh, e e by text uh, with you, have a conversation, derive the kind of information, and get you a quote and or get you to buy the insurance. So I have a goal. The use case is to try to shrink the amount of time it takes for me to get you a quote. So I have a business purpose, a use case, and I get the organization around that. Now one thing we haven't talked about, and important for someone like you, Lee, you need leadership from the organization. One of the things that speeds adoption rates is leadership from the top. Yep. It's rare you get speedy adoption rate from the bottom. And that's one of the things we see with IP Center. If I go and take 42 modules of managing a company's IT infrastructure and try to get the 42 people who run ops or run those tools and manage those, I will be talking eons before you get adoption. But if I have a visionary at the top who says, we're moving, we're going to transition to a digital type environment, we want to go to this operational OSS, we're moving. Now I have the participation of the normal blockers. Right. So speed of adoption is really driven a lot by the level at which, in the organization, it's being driven. It's a, it's a really, really good point. And I, and I think, uh, as well, each of the three of you, I think there's a misconception that like, automation is a multi-tool. Um, it is a multi-tool, but you need to know which one of those things you're going to pull out of the multi-tool to use for what. So I heard, I heard use case have a business problem to solve. And I think it's, it's a little bit different, I mean, uh, in, in speaking with uh, Mihir and his team over time, they, they have clients where things have gone viral. Uh, there's been viral adoption. Mm. But with something like Cognitive or NLP or a transition to something in a fully digital management uh, environment, that leadership from the top really has to be there with a use case, with a business problem. Yeah, if, I, if I could add to that, Lee, and I think we spoke about this, we're at a conference for a purpose, and, and we'll throw you know, a commercial to KPMG at the moment, um, and I'll accept gratuities later. But um, the, the facts of the matter is you're also not going to do it without a partner. Um, what we're finding in most companies today, 
uh, is that we have taken out the, the strategic intelligent layer. We have relegated people to legacy management and therefore they're more like operational types. And remember, my operational types are the people that tend to want to hold on to people, hold on to their tools. So if I can't find that strategic thinker, that change agent, the person that wants to run a digital transformation, one of the things that I always want to recommend is please go and find someone like KPMG who has a practice about leading you through this digital transformation. And in that partnership, you have a whole lot better chance of implementing IBM Watson, uh, Automation Anywhere, or anything we do. Because again, you're gonna be dealing with a pushback, an inertia inside of a corporation. You need a partner to really ease this process. I'm interested um, in each of you to react to uh, what, what appears to be resistance, but when, when you, when you go one layer back, it seems to me it, it, it's either disbelief or it's fear. Uh, so as you contemplate the clients that you have engaged with um, and, and overcome the resistance, what did you find it was based on? Was it, was it a, a disbelief that there was value in this? Or was it fear of, uh, of what, it, what it might do? Maybe uh, Rich, yes, you can start. So we haven't hit the fear problem as much. I mean, only because the, you know, the professions we are targeting, right? I mean, most of the use cases we're using with Watson is, is not about displacing human being, it's about augmenting human intelligence. So we haven't hit the fear factor as much. Uh, it is, you know, the show me, the prove me, show me this works and how is this going to be different. Um, the one lesson that I think all of us, at least in, in IBM Watson, have learned is that this is not your normal IT project where you go in and go to requirements, design, development, load testing, right? I mean, that's the paradigm we, we've learned, we've all grew up in. But, uh, you know, in, in these kinds of technologies, there is no programming involved, right? You know, you, either the machine can do this uh, or it cannot. Right? I mean, I, I'll keep making references back to what Ray Kurzweil is talking about. 300 million modules, we've maybe you know, hardened 28 to 32 model, modules. Right? Uh, there's lot, millions of modules to come, which is why it's gonna take another 20 years to get there. So it is really about show me the value, show me this is gonna generate you know, the ROI, uh, and, then, and then and prove it. So that's how we actually, with, with Watson, start our journey is really helping the clients through that discovery process, mm -hmm. having them, you know, giving them comfort that this does work, using their data, using their content, and once they see it, they believe it, then we really start the, the job of the corporate development. Yeah. So I'm here in, in, in Automation Anywhere's uh, experience when you have met resistance initially and you get past it, what, what did you find actually being the basis for that resistance? I think there are two kinds of people we find. One who have their head buried in sand and don't know what's happening in the world. Um, so some ignorance. And they hang out with people like, like them. So the, uh, so the and so you know conferences like this uh, are very helpful. Um, the second part is uh, a leader has to lead. It, this is an opportunity. Uh, you end up with a manager, this is not a management problem, this is a leadership problem. Uh, if you don't act, the way we see it is the digital workforce wave and the virtual reality wave, they are gonna superimpose each other and you're gonna get a tsunami wave. Now, as a leader, you could choose to surf it or be wiped out by it. And it takes, you know, at a early stage, it takes uh, special kind of people, uh, few in this room, uh, to, to, to lead it. Well, I think we heard from Jonathan that leadership from the top is, is really a component. Um, have you experienced, Jonathan, people that uh, have a starting point of disbelief? You know, I, I, there's another individual that I've spoken with. Every time I use the, the expression proof of concept, around him, he, he visibly flinches because he's like, why is anybody proving this? We know it works. Hmm. Um, uh, but there's always a component of prove it to me. Yes. Um, have, have, have you found that, that disbelief uh, is, is still 
a component of resistance? I think it's in both phases. Uh, if you think about IT management, it's always still there because no one could have uh, basically this ubiquitous tool that integrates all software, all monitoring systems, all everything into one common single pane of glass visibility control. Come on, no one does that. Uh, let, let's call that the unicorn in the industry. But in fact, that is what we do. And getting people to believe that is still an evangelistic effort. Um, and part of it is because um, you basically have built a company uh, with what I would call tool mongers uh, who dove deeply into a problem set, developed and bought software and people skills and intelligence associated with that deep dive. Then they had the problem of interconnecting that information to other deep dive tools and things that they had purchased. So now what you've got in most organizations is 20, 30, 50 tools, all of which have been associated with a deep dive, gaining information, and not necessarily integrated to the knowledge. So what you always have are those fun meetings where you go to a very large conference room, scream and yell at each other, and the person that's armed with the best tool, he's, he, that's uh, called the race to the innocents, right? Uh, I'm gonna prove I'm innocent uh, first. And that's the game, and we gotta stop that. We, we've gotta be able to integrate these kinds of capabilities into one common factual understanding People are afraid of that because they've built their careers, their reputations, their skill set, and their worker team on that tool. And that's the value to the company. And if you challenge them and give them the sense that this tool or new thing you're introducing could put them at risk, they're going to fight back. It's right. always going to be the case. It takes some work and time to get them to see the value of integration, the contribution they can make in a broader sense. On the Amelia side in the new cognitive technology, it's about fear of job loss. If I could tell you I could take Amelia and put her into a 100-person customer service center and have probably five people required to run it after she got up and running, the 95 people who all want to look at themselves and get nervous about what's this new technology my exec is introducing into my customer service center, they're going to be afraid. You're introducing it as job elimination. I want to understand its job enhancement, or I've got a job opportunity. And one of the really fine firms uh, that we work with, McKesson, has really thought about this kind of impact on their, on their community of employees. If we introduce these kinds of technologies, how might we train the people, transition the people, transfer the people? I think that's one of our obligations of adoption mm -hmm. as we look at this new technology is that we are proactively in our leadership role thinking about the impact on people because if we do it right, it speeds adoption. I, if we I'll do it wrong, step out of my, wrong. my role as a facilitator here in my own journey. Our pace of adoption has been, we intentionally matched it with our growth and turnover. Mm. Uh, and very deliberately uh, to be able to message because you really do need your entire enterprise to adopt and to participate in this, in this new thing that you're doing. Uh, and, and moving too quickly can actually cause uh, reverse effects. Yeah. Surprisingly, we, we suspected we will get a lot of fear of jobs, but we don't see it as much on the ground. There is enough what I call young blood <laughs> on, the, on, the, on, the, on the ground that is excited by it. There are celebrations of birth of a bot and people name bots and it's a, it's, it's, it feels like a bot party. And I, I didn't expect that to be that way, right? And we were worried and, but it's not as bad as, you know, sometimes it seems to be, we overthink it, you know. And, then, and there, are, there are young kids who grew up with CD and iPad and so they said, oh, did you do this manually before, really? I mean, you know, they were surprised that you did it differently. So, seems all right. You yeah. know? I mean, there's, there's, it, it always comes up, but it, it's not your top, top uh, uh, hardest challenge. Yeah. So. I, I, actually, if we, if we have the right change management programs, mm -hmm. uh, you will see that it's these people who are doing this repetitive task saying, how do I just out-task this to a, to a smart machine so I can do yeah. bigger, better things? I think that the, uh, the component of of, of thinking through the people impacts as you consider a use case is, is another reasonable thing for people to, to, 
to put into their Get Started program, right? Um, what kind of people are you dealing with? Are you augmenting a physician's capability for a recommendation for treatment options? Uh, are you creating capacity uh, to move people into uh, data insights and analytics who used to simply be administering a process? Uh, it's, I think it's, it's each of those components are, is, a, is a component of uh, contemplation for the use case, yeah? So uh, interesting, I'm, I'm just a, kind of a binary question, but it's interesting if we, if we talk about each of the spaces that you play in, uh, and I'll ask each of you to respond separately, do you consider or do your clients consider what you provide to be IT? Is it IT? So we'll start with Ravesh. Is so I, we don't think this is IT. We, you know, we, we start with, the, you know, remember I mentioned start with the business problem. So you really start with the line of business to make sure that you've, you're really focused on the right high value areas. That's where you start. Most of our sponsors are, you know, business oriented, whether they're the, the head of banking or a customer experience or, or oncology. Uh, and then, you know, once we've framed the journey, the value, they understand the right use case, they understand how, how Watson or cognitive technologies will help them transform their business, then at, at some point, you do get engagement from IT, but that's really when you're ready to go deploy, right? I mean, do you have the right cloud security, the right infrastructure? Do I know what, where, do I, where do I need to integrate from? Do I, can I get the right data? Am I curating it? Am I deduping it? Things like that. But really starts with the business problem. And I keep if you don't start with the right business problem and you start with the right scientific example of let's just, this is cool technology, let's go prototype it, you'll almost end up with the wrong use case. And we've, 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 we've experienced that. So it really starts with the business. Okay, Mihir, do you have a point of view? Is, is, is your product IT? So it always starts with business. Um, if anybody is from IT here, I, I apologize in advance, but IT is the same <laughs> IT that said email is a bad idea. Uh, laptop is a terrible idea. We have all this infrastructure and everyday people walking out with everything I got. It's the worst idea in the world. Um, it's, it comes from the part of their job responsibility. So where we are on this cycle, it's going to be always led by business. It always has been. Um, but in all of our deployments, once you cross 500 bots in the scale that comes with it in management, deployment, running, you have you know, data centers, you know, this is your new virtual office running it, uh, IT is unavoidable. Uh, what happens is by that time, IT got no argument. Uh, I mean, they can get some check boxes right, but the business value is established, the dramatic benefits. Um, and then IT, IT comes in. Uh, it, is, it is unavoidable at that scale. Uh, for, you, for you, Jonathan, it must be really unique because you're actually dealing with IT, bringing, auto, do they look at what you do as IT? Uh, if you look at IP Center and what it does for IT management, infrastructure management, you know, every aspect of that, software and, and uh, databases, you name it, uh, all of that goes under the heading of IT. And IT CIO type leadership, they're typically intimately involved in implementing a new operating uh, system, operating framework. So you'll get very much involved in IT. As you now go over into the new cognitive technologies though, as all of, uh, these gentlemen have said, you're really in the business unit side because what you're doing is we're going back to how do I enhance customer experience? And again, with no offense whatsoever to the CIOs in the room, you're not really thinking so much about the end user customer experience. You're thinking about mostly internal and trying to keep the lights on and making the systems run with some hope of managing the websites and doing some of the things that are revenue stimulative. Where I think the CIO, CIOs want to go is to be very much connected to business unit demand be participants in working with these new technologies so they really can shift out of legacy management and really be part of business strategy, business implementation. To do that, they have to change their business processes. They have to get much more connected to the business units. And so we're back to this whole issue of leadership, 
business transformation. If we're going to build a digital company, what does it look like? What are your roles and responsibilities? And so all of these technologies we're talking about here really do change the nature of not only work, but they also change the nature of organization. And that's one of the things we start to see yep. is a real rethink on how we organize, again, starting at the right point, the customer, and go backwards. Start there, come backwards into how does your company run itself? How does it organize? Where are the priorities? And I think as you ingest more and more of these digital capabilities, more and more of the ability to manage analytics, uh, to take sophisticated big data and start putting that at problem solution levels, you're going to change the way companies are run. You're going to change the names that people have as job titles. And I think we're going to see a, an enormous change in the next five years. One, one request I would have with the business leader is we have few examples where business leader would, you know, would tell an IT and say, remember that ticket that was open for 12 years and you said take two years? I just closed it. And there is this tendency of business telling IT back, you know, uh, resist that, that temptation and, uh, you know, bring IT in. <laughs> <laughs> At the right time. <laughs> yeah. Right time. Right time. Uh, again, speaking on my personal journey, uh, when IT first was brought in, they put, put a stake in the ground and said, this is IT. Yeah. You can't have it. You can't manage it. Uh -huh. um, and we actively resisted that. Um, uh, and it took a year, I think, before they really began to understand it's a business tool. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm interested, uh, you guys have experience with a lot of different customers and implementations. Um, as you think about some of the worst experiences you've had uh, with uh, clients that have failed to adopt, embrace, and be successful, because we know your stuff works, all three of you. We know your stuff works. What were the mistakes that were made? What would be the things that you would say to this audience, watch out for this, and, and if you see this, it, it, could, it could kill it? So we'll start with Ravash. Yeah, so the, the, you know, this is still early days for us. We are in year three. But the early <coughs> mistakes was really treating this as a, as a science project, not looking at you know, the right use case where, where that give, can drive significant impact, right? Um, some of our early clients, you know, steered us, you know, because we, we, are, an IT, we are an IT company, um, it steered us towards solving some really hard technical problems. Um, but then, you know, we, it took us a while to, to fix this, and we, we fixed mm -hmm. it, we realized we, you know, these weren't the, this is a good technical problem to solve, but not a high, high business value problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, we refocused our approach, you know, we go through a discovery phase uh, specifically to go make sure we are focused on the right use cases because the last thing any client wants is to just push, you know, whether it's IBM or others to pick the wrong use case, spend a year building the corpus and then figuring, realizing that that was not the right use case because there wasn't enough business value. So that, that was the one lesson that we learned in our early days. I remind every client, every you know, any workshop that I participate in, I help them understand the mistakes we've made, you know, what, what have we learned to help them make sure that they learn from our mistakes and, you know, make sure we focus on the right high value use cases. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, coming back to uh, picking the wrong use case mm -hmm. can kill the effort. Yes. Right? If you don't contemplate something that really d derives yeah. Business value. Yeah. So you really have to, and don't don't pick the hardest use case. Don't don't because, you know, there are always there's always the naysayers, people who want to, you know, who may or may not believe in this technology. Pick the ones that you can be successful, you can show value fast, um, and then and then scale from there. But this is why a lot of the journey mapping that we do is important because, you you set the vision, you set you know the the goalpost of where you're the, where you're going, but you start small and then incrementally you know build your build your weight there. Thank you. Jonathan, what have you seen in terms of uh, clients that tried and failed or that had uh, start, stop, maybe a do-over um, or just never really got it across the line? What have, what have you seen? I think that what happens is you start with enthusiasm and you believe that you're going to automate your entire environment and boy, this is exciting, let's go on that journey. And then uh, the rubber meets the road and you find that's not that easy. 
and there's a lot of run book automation that has to occur, rethinking about how you're doing things and so forth. So all of a sudden the pace slows a bit and the rapidity of what you thought you were gonna accomplish now becomes real work. Well, once that happens in an organization, you get people leadership changes, uh, you get uh, real, you know, people that just get tired and they move on, they get moved in. And now all of a sudden you're retraining and you're reteaching and you're reconvicting. And so the, I think the organizational dynamics are probably our biggest impediment to consistent implementation mm. because we're always going to be dealing with different execs, different CIOs, different whatever, and on the ground. We have one case in a bank um, that um, one of the execs chose to use us, integrating multiple database environments. The project was going great. Every one of the people left that institution, typical recycling of financial uh, execs in the industry, every one of the people from the exec VP to the actual project leader moved to another financial institution. And by that time, we had to basically re-evangelize an entire uh, organization and we were exhausted. So from our standpoint, it really is, automation is a journey. And, and uh, I think on IBM's website, they talk about the cognitive experience, it's a journey. We should all think about, we're going to take a journey and it's not going to be automatic, even though the word automation sounds like it, it's not. And it's going to take uh, participation and it has a time frame associated with it. And we should not be overly um, quick to think, ah, oh, well, let's just get immediate results and we'll get the next immediate results. You're gonna to have to have a discipline in the organization and consistent leadership in order to really accomplish any of these implementations. Thank you, very insightful. Mihir, what have you seen in, uh, in organizations? I, I love the notion, by the way, Jonathan, of people think there's an automatic yeah. uh, component to this, but the, the, the work of automation is no less real work than any other work that you might do. Um, so Mihir, what have you seen in terms of, of, of failed? So two, two lessons learned. One was uh, people have an inclination to go for 100% automation and cover every single scenario. And very early on, we, we, we learned that we go there and say, stop talking about every single exception in the world. If everything was as you expected, how much will just pass through? And people say 70%. And I said, I don't want to hear about any exception at all. Let all exceptions be handled by people. Let's get 70% return. That's a good goal to start with. And that worked you know, surprisingly well. Really, you, it cut down all the discussions. And so there was one learning. Um, and you have to really prevent people from going there. We, we, mm -hmm. All humans have a tendency to describe you know, how complex things the, it is that we work with you. Uh, the second lesson was if we get a leader in a deal that um, we are talking to them and a leader would delegate this responsibility to someone else. And I would, uh, our, our, our leadership would ask the leader a question and say, what else are you doing uh, that gives you 60% return? If you, are, if you have a project that gives you 6% return and you delegate a project that gives you 60% return, we walk away from the deal. It's not worth it. Mm -hmm. you, you got your priorities wrong. Right. <laughs> Very good. We got, a, we got a question from the audience um, that maybe each of you can, uh, can address because I think you'll have a different answer. So the question is what companies are doing this well and what are examples of their success that most of us will be aware of? And I, uh, you know, if we talk about Watson and MD Anderson, you know, obviously that's been quite quite public, um, but I'm, I'm interested to add a, a part B to that question is, and are you finding companies willing to even talk about the fact that they're doing this publicly? So uh, what companies are doing this well, Jonathan, and, and what are examples of their success that, that we would be aware of? So let's take um, two examples. We'll use um, our first virtual engineer technology we'll call IP Center. And uh, one of the things we did is we've been using that for years, 17 years in, in the making, and we decided to basically build it into a platform, sassify it, and put it in the hands of service providers. So one of the uh, 
really good success tracks that we would talk about is IBM. IBM had to radically change its service delivery platform, change its cost structure, its offer to its client base, and it couldn't from its own internal technologies and resources pull that off. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did is we partnered up. Mm -hmm. And we were able to give IBM uh, our platform, and they now have rebranded it. They call it Dynamic Automation, and it is giving them very good success with their client base, retention on their existing base, and offering new sets of services. So we're very proud of that business relationship. Same thing with NTT, Dimension Data. So on the service provider on the IP center side, good success. What we're seeing really quickly on the cognitive side is the invention of this customer touch concept where uh, one uh, financial institution in particular decided that it needed to change the way it qualified you for a mortgage. <coughs> So Lee, you've just come in, you've bought your first home, you come to this bank and you say, I need to be pre-qualified, I want to go bid on this new property. And it takes them 24 days to approve you, even though I'm sure you're, you're flush, right? <laughs> so at the end of the day, you go through this process and you're just absolutely bewildered by the length of the process, who you are, have had a relationship with the bank, all those things, but it took you 24 days. You got to shorten that because the market requires it. I want to bid on a property. I don't want to take that long. So how do I work with the, the bank to provide a front end, change the way in which you communicate with the end user, and get to a day? There's a goal. Can I get pre-qualification of a mortgage down to a day? Because you will see some of the ads for Rocket Mortgage and some of these other guys, they're changing the game. Mm -hmm. I cannot stay as a stodgy banking institution and believe that customers are going to come for mortgages for me if I'm taking 24 days to give you, who's a clearly qualified prospect, that answer. So what's happening is working with that financial institution, putting Amelia into that front end, working with the data in the background, so she can extract the kinds of useful information she needs, she's now sped that process up. Right. So now the question is, for the institution, do you charge more for that? Do you actually go out and say, for that type of mortgage process, it might be a little extra dollars? So there's a little bit of that marketing trial going on to see, by doing that, could I create more revenue? Could I get more prospects? Can I deploy my capital more rapidly? All these things are pretty interesting end results. Now, uh, just one tie on for that financial customer, do they, do they put Amelia as a point of pride down? Um, the use of, of that cognitive uh, automation? We expect them to. Uh, we have a relationship such that we expect that they'll announce that that's what they're doing. And now they put the gauntlet down to the rest of the financial institutions to say, this is what we've done. This is how we change the game. And they're advertising that in their campaigns. Great. Um, here. I think we, uh, we're fortunate to have a few success stories public, about uh, 20 or 30 of them. Uh, for example, the county that we are all sitting in runs all the county services on, on it for the last five years, right? all the processes. Um, Fortunate, I think I guess it's okay to say since you are on the stage, later AT&T was featured in uh, Wall Street Journal two days back and they are a, a panelist later today. Um, and ANZ and quite a few other success stories. I think what we are hoping to see now though, and uh, you, you can never have enough, uh, but we are beginning to see a different kind of a success story where the, the cost advantage and all of that is coming, but there are single bots that are beginning to produce $5 million benefit, single bot producing it. And you see it here, you see it there, you see it there. And suddenly you have to realize that this is, a, this is, not, a, this is not a logical extension to automation that we have seen in the past. This is this entire wave, not just us. This is like a new iPhone where people who created iPhone did not imagine that we will be sharing our homes and cars on, on that device. Nobody could have predicted it. Like that, we are not able to, none of us saw it this way, but it's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not quite Uber yet, <laughs> but a one bot producing that, and you have five of them, and suddenly you stop asking about returns. Mm -hmm. I think we're two years out before that story fully emerges. You know, there are isolated incidences. 
But I think that's what we will all uh, will begin to see, and I you know, hope mm -hmm. conversation goes there uh, in two years. So we've, we've just got uh, four minutes left. We've got another question from the audience, I think, that uh, is very timely. Um, and the question is, uh, well, actually, we've got several here. Let's, uh, let's go through with uh, feature functionality growth. Um, if each of you could uh, reveal uh, one or two top priorities for features and functionality um, that would uh, accelerate adoption or ease adoption or improve dramatically the, 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 the capabilities of, of what you provide. Maybe we'll start, uh, Ravesh, yeah. with you. So I'll, I'll speak of it in, in non-IT terms and try to steal from uh, what Ray Kurzweil was talking about earlier. Uh, when we talk when we talk about feature functionality, when when we when we launched Watson, uh, Watson could read and it could read in English. And since then, we you know we're teaching it sensory functions. It can now see, it can hear. Uh, we're giving it you know a, a form factor where Watson's actually you know there's several ro robots that are now ro you know powered by Watson. Uh, we're teaching in multiple languages. You know, it was English. Now we have Brazilian, Portuguese, Japanese, Arabic, Spanish, um, you know, Korean. So we're starting to our feature functionality is really on on the languages, on the mm -hmm. sensory functions. Uh, you know, he mentioned 300 million modules. Right, the way we we are architecting Watson is as a platform. So we now have APIs that map to these these modules in the neocortex, where we can do natural language processing. Uh, we can, you know, do tone analysis, right? So we're developing these, uh, at least reverse engineering some of these functions as APIs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our library of APIs is going to grow. Last year we had, you know, when we started we had two APIs. We're up to 32. We'll, you know, soon be up to 100. So that that will keep growing. So it's both horizontal, vertical expansions. And then the other thing we are also trying to do is take what's into market by industry. So how do you, you know, put Watson in the, in the business of so is this, oil and gas exploration? Is, is this a case of where you are predefining? Because one of the other questions we got was, what are you doing to reduce how long it takes to learn, to train yes. cognitive? So are, are you kind of sending it to uh, primary school in an industry and, and, and pre-feeding it a corpus which allows it to enter that field with a, a basis of of expertly defined corpus? See, the, is, yes and no, because there's, it's, uh, there are some businesses, for example, um, where clients, you know, uh, we're working within the enterprise space, want to keep a proprietary content, you know, and we're not in the business of taking your content and selling it to somebody else. That's not, that's not our business model, right? Uh, but we have some clients who actually want to do that. So I'll use the MSK example, because it's a great success story. We, we took uh, some of the brightest doctors in Memorial Sloan Kettering, trained a corpus of, of Watson around oncology, and they actually wanted to share their content. So we took it to Brahman Grad Hospital, largest cancer institute in Asia. We took it to Manipal in, in India, where now you've got parts of different parts of the world who are actually benefiting from this content because it's trained by an MSK doctor. So the business models vary, right? So you we, and in some cases, we are creating a public corpus because it's based on public data. But it's yeah. you know, we have to curate it. We have to curate that ourselves. So, uh, so for automation anywhere, what are what are the top one or two features or functions that are uh, soon to be debuted that will really uh, change the game with how how people adopt automation? So there are two. One is we are significantly focused on combining this cognitive RPA and analytics together in a seamless way where it offers a frictionless service and when you remove friction from any economies, everything soars. So uh, imagine if you, any, uh, all of us who watch sports, when something happens right there, you have every single data available. Now your digital workforce will, every single aspect of your business will operate like that. It knows when something happens, everything about it, and all three together, uh, self-measured, self-assessed, self-monitored workforce, digital workforce. Uh, the second part is we are doing it on demand. So you know, for a recent announcement is about Bot Farm, where with a click of a button, I can call 30,000 digital worker 
and when it is done, you fold it back. Um, so your ability to do on-call demand thousands of them and fold it back uh, so that your cost curve will first so, time So ever you're a temp agency now, is that? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, uh, well, that's one way to see it, but even, <laughs> even, even for all kinds of load, where can you get your cost curve to mimic exactly your revenue curve? And that's one of the biggest challenge we all leaders right. have a face, right? We, we have to invest and yes. hope for the best. And now, if you could do as much on demand. Uh, so so a can, fluid, a dynamic labor force. As, as fluid as you, you know, almost right. like an Uber model, if you will, right? In, right? in terms of completely match supply and demand. And if you could get there, that, that would be nirvana for, for the business leader. All right, well, I was uh, going to ask Jonathan to respond to that last week. We're a minute and a half over time. Um, I don't know if. Do we have, we can go for it? Uh, all right, As Jonathan, we've been granted a few more moments. Thank you, so I'll make it brief. But uh, I think that if we really think about this concept of automation and we talked about what are we gonna upgrade on the IP center side, uh, two areas that are gonna be interesting. One, we're gonna automate automation. The process of automation today still has a human intervention element in it. Well, the question would be why? If I could identify what it is associated with that problem, that incident, that event, and I could basically classify it and correlate it and figure it out. I don't need a human inside to kind of look at the decision tree, drag and drop and do something. I'll just go to automation and get customer approval. Mm -hmm. So I think that's gonna be big. The other thing is, let's change monitoring because what's happening in monitoring, especially in financial services, is you believe that history matters because that's the way we do monitoring and make decisions from data. But in financial trading and financial markets, history actually could be an impediment to your thought process. So anomaly detection becomes very important when you begin to look at that day, that moment in time, what is really happening and what should I be doing about it? Mm -hmm. And so we want to speed up the identification of the issue and the problem. And uh, so that, that you're going to see us enhancing. On the, on the uh, Amelia side, I think it's, really all about this uh, new ability to add emotional content, this ability to do two things. Amelia to have emotion, meaning I can go up and down, I'm not an atonal IVR. But more importantly, Lee, I can test, you're getting testy with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not giving you the answer I should. I'm sensing that I'm not uh, providing what it is you look for, so I'm immediately going and bringing an agent, live agent with me. So, so sent sentiment analysis yes. uh, for departure from right. back to a human. But if I also think you're happy, I'm going to sell like reckless abandon. I'm going for it. Because if you're happy, then I'm going for it. And I'm going to say, would you like to buy this particular product? We happen to have it on sale, or I want to elevate you and give you this bundle, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You're going to make a move based on uh, understanding just exactly where you are in that process of relationship. I don't do it if I'm sensing that you're not angry, I haven't solved the problem. I do do it if I believe that you're in a state that would make you receptive. So these are the kinds of changes as we sophisticate the capability of this virtual call agent. I think these are the kinds of changes we'll see. So as Ray, Ray described it, more and more we're going to find intelligence, but also coupled with emotional and human understanding are going to be combined in these technologies. And I think that's going to drive adoption rate. Well, thank you very much for that. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm left uh, just kind of wondering what 2020 is going to look like uh, as we uh, go through this exponential growth uh, just for four more years. Um, so uh, I want to thank each of you. I hope uh, this was helpful in, in meeting the, the, the challenge here, enabling the fourth industrial revolution in terms of what you can do, what not to do, how to get started, uh, what's coming uh, on the near-term horizon. So uh, please, uh, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.